All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us for another session uh, of DOTS. Uh, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker uh, of the day, Marcia Fampa. Marcia is a full professor at the Federal University uh, of Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, uh, where she has been since 97 and where she also obtained uh, her, uh, her uh, PhD. Uh, Marcia uh, has advised uh, roughly 30 PhD and uh, master's students. Um, and she has been a visiting researcher at the University uh, of Iowa. She's also written a, a book uh, on linear optimization in Portuguese and a book on the topic, I guess, of this talk, uh, Maximum Entropy Sampling Algorithms and Application with, uh, with John Lee. And her interests are uh, in the area of mixed integer uh, nonlinear programming, which she's going to tell us more about today. So, Marsha, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Elias, for the nice introduction. Thank you, all the organizer, Alexander, for inviting me. It's actually a pleasure to be a speaker to our discrete optimization talks. And my talk is about an application, actually, of convex integer nonlinear programming for maximal entropy sampling. So this is our setting. We are giving a vector here of n random theory, uh, uh, n random variables with joint density function GN. And our goal is actually to select a subset of these variables with fixed cardinality S. So that if you observe just the subset of the variables, maximize information obtained about all the variables. And this, the information here is measured by differential entropy, as was described by Shannon in his nice paper from 1948. Now we know that if the variables have Gaussian distribution, John Gaussian distribution with covariance matrix C, then this H of S here is the expression for the differential entropy of the subset of the variables that we select. So from this formula, we can see that to select the subset of variables that maximizes the information is actually equivalent to select an S order principal submatrix of the covariance matrix of the variables in order to maximize the log of the determinant of the principal submatrix. Okay. So we can formulate an optimization problem that we call the maximum entropy sampling problem. And where we actually are looking for the principal submatrix of C of order S that maximizes the log of the determinant. The optimization problem can be formulated over the subsets of indices of rows and columns of our matrix C and can also be formulated uh, over this vector of binary elements. Okay, so the binary vector X, where a, a, S of X would, will be the support of X. This makes the equivalence between the two. And we also consider a more general version of the problem that we call the constrained maximum entropy sampling problem, or CMAS. And now we, we also allow uh, linear inequalities on the variables. Okay, and of course, the, the linear constraints can allow us to model constraints like budget constraints and something like that. Well, CMAS is an interesting uh, nonlinear integer program, not only because of the applications that we will discuss uh, in a few minutes, but also because this is actually an example of what we call a non-factorable uh, nonlinear non integer program, which means that the objective function here of our problem cannot be decomposed into nonlinear functions that are usually contained on the libraries for solvers for global optimization. So this is in fact a challenging problem for people who do research or software developers in the area of global optimization or mixed integer nonlinear optimization. Okay, this is our key application that we have been working a lot uh, with this uh, problem. This is an application and environmental monitoring. In fact, there's an application on the monitoring of acid rain in the United States, where we have a, a big network with hundreds of monitoring sites like this one, 
that we have the picture here, which actually contains buckets to save water from the rain and save them to be analyzed later. Okay, and the goal to analyze the water of the rain is to actually investigate the concentration of some pollutants or some chemistry in the water. And these chemi chemistry are important to be analyzed because they can in fact low the pH of the water of the rain and producing what we call the acid rain. And the acid rain is dangerous for our health and therefore it's important to monitor the acid rain. And it's also important to select from this monitoring sites, the one that we are actually going to get the samples of water to analyze. So this leads to what we call this network contraction problem where the goal is basically to choose the subset of the sites with the idea that future observations will only be collected at the subset of the sites. And of course, this is to decrease the cost on the analyzing the samples. And the interesting thing about this application is, is that we have a lot of data to, to, to use. Okay, we have this uh, univariant time series that are available for all the monitoring sites, and we can actually use the data to calculate uh, a sample of the a covariance matrix and you actually formulate instances of the mass problem using this data that are available. Well, the problem has been uh, brought to the attention of the mathematical optimization community since 1995, when Shanko, John Lee, and Maurice Kareem published this nice paper on the problem. And on that paper, uh, they already uh, proved it, that the that mass is NP hard. And John Lee has been working a lot on this problem since then. More recently, he proved it with his student, Hessa Altani that in the special case where the covariance matrix is tridiagonal or the inverse also of the covariance matrix, which is equivalent, we will see is tridiagonal in this particular case, the mass can be solved in polynomial time by dynamic programming. But on the other hand, C mass is an NP-hard problem, even if C is very simple, a, a, a diagonal matrix. And even if we have only one constraint, one linear extra uh, constraint. And this, of course, comes because the problem corresponds to a, a fuller case of the NAPSAP binary problem. So we can see that it is NP hard. So our goal is, in fact, to you know, investigate exact algorithms to solve CMAS. And our approach is based on convex, mixed integer, nonlinear programming formulations for the problem. So what we want is to apply algorithms like range and bound or our approximation for our constructed convex formulations. Of course, the success of these approaches uh, depend a lot on the quality of lower and upper bounds for the problem that we can construct. And for lower bounds, we have heuristics that already proposed by Foley and Kirin in 1995 for mass. These are greedy heuristics and local search heuristics. And John also proposed some heuristics for CMAS based on an uh, integer linear. And these are the heuristics are actually very good for the instances that we have been solving. In fact, there are, there are a lot of instances for which these and uh, heuristics actually find already the, the optimal solution. So our work in this case is basically to prove that these optimal solutions are optimal. And for that, we need good upper bounds, right, for the problem. And our upper bounds, to, con to construct this upper bounds, we use convex optimization relaxation for CMAS. So we have been working a lot on these convex optimization relaxations. We are looking for relaxations that give tight bounds, but also can be solved efficiently, can be solved fast. And there are some uh, uh, properties and facts about these convex relaxations that are very general and can be applied to the different relaxations that we work with. 
And some of them have been used it very, uh, with, with a lot of success, with a, uh, improving a lot the nausea and animals. And here we have three of them described. The first one is about the scaling the, the covariance matrix. And of course, if you scale the covariance matrix multiplied by a scale factor, you have the objective value of C mask just shifted by this constant here, right? So this means that if we get an upper bound for the scaled problem, where we just consider the scaled covariance matrix, we of course get an upper bound for our original problem too. And the interesting thing is that when we scale the matrix, although the, the integer uh, the, the, the value of the integer solution is just shifted by a constant. This not necessarily happens with the solution of the relaxation. So we can, in fact, get better bounds solving relaxations with a scalar uh, covariance matrix. With all this, this was already used in 1999 and 1996 in these works. Uh, here, this, this is me. We are, I'm working here with John Lee, Curtin Stryker, and Joy Williams. We were, Joy and I were PhD students at this time. And I spent some time at the University of Iowa doing my PhD. And we worked on this, already on this problem that this became a big part of my PhD thesis. And another important factor here is uh, gives, gives uh, you know, produce what we call the complementary problem. And this comes from, from the relation between the determinant of the submatrix or the, the principal submatrix of the matrix C and the determinant of the complementary principal submatrix of the inverse of C. So using this relation, of course, we can uh, I see this relation between what we call our original problem and our complementary problem. And again, if we compute upper bounds for the complementary problems, we have upper bounds for original problem too. And finally, another fact that has been used, this was considered later by John and Curtin Stryker and then John and Sam Berrer, uh, is, is the uses the Oppenheim inequality. And using the Oppenheim inequality, we can see that if we multiply our covariance matrix by a correlation matrix, right? This is the Hadamard product here. Then we can, we can get an upper bound again for our original problem. So if we choose nice uh, correlation matrices, which we call masks, we can actually derive good upper bounds for our problem that can be efficiently computed again. So all these uh, uh, properties have been used in all of our convex relaxations that we have been working with for CMAS. And finally, one other thing that gives them as an advantage of working with convex uh, relaxations is this result that, that can, you know, it's a, a, a well-known result that we can fix variables in our original problem based on convex duality. So if we have a lower star problem, which we have from the heuristics that we have in the literature, and we have also know a, a dual feasible solution for convex relaxation, then you the dual variables related to the bounds on our primal variables, we can actually fix the variables, the primal variables in zero and one, if this relation years are satisfied. This has been very useful for us since the first paper in 1996, we already used this procedure. And we, when we have small duality gaps for our instances, we can fix a lot of variables using this kind of, of technique here, which can all can be applied to all of our convex relaxations again. So this is very general to all the convex relaxations that we have been using for this draw. And I'm going to talk about each relaxation specifically. 
So the first, we, I'm going to talk about the main ones, the one that we are using with more, more success in, in our numerical frameworks. The first one is already the, what we call the NLP relaxation, the NLP bound that was uh, developed in, during my PhD thesis, in fact. So <laughs> this comes from the observation that if we, you know, this matrix here can be written as this, you know, linear function on our variables X and the given matrix C, and the, this is the vector of all ones. So it's easy to see that this matrix written like this as a, a function of X is actually given by this construction here. And of course, the determinant of this matrix here, it's exactly the determinant of the principal submatrix of our covariance uh, matrix. So because of that, we can actually formulate our problem C mask as this problem here, where we use here exactly this function. Right, so this is the determinant of the, the principal submatrix of our matrix C. The only problem with this formulation is that this objective function is not concave. So if we relax the integrality constraints here, we do not get a convex relaxation for our problem. So it's not good for us because we want convex relaxations that can be solved efficiently to obtain bounds in an efficient way. But this was actually the, the formulation that we, you know, uh, produced the first convex uh, relaxation for our problem. Our objective function was based on that matrix, uh, the matrix on the objective function of our NLP relaxation was based on that matrix. And what we, we see here is that we added some parameters in the, 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 you know, the objective function. And these parameters actually, what we prove it is that if they choose it in a proper way, they make the objective function concave. So we actually in this paper propose three different ways of choosing these parameters. And we prove that each one of them le led to a convex optimization problem. Actually it's convex and it is smooth and it can be Effic efficiently solve it. At the time we implemented an point methods to solve this relaxation because we didn't have any solver, commercial solvers to solve it. But today we can solve it with, you know, available solvers that in the and another thing that we realized at the time already is that the complementary problem and the scalar problem can actually bear be, be very useful here. We can bet, get better bounds if we use the inverse of the covariance matrix and also if we choose the scalar, scalar factor in a, a good way. Okay, so these choices of the parameters that they not only consider that we want to make the problem convex, we want to make the objective function concave, but they always also consider that we want to choose these parameters to minimize the bounds. So we want to get the best possible bound with the choice of the parameters. So this are, is also discussed in the paper and you know the choices are aiming at a good bound. Well, more recently, Kurt and Stryker continued also to work on the problem and proposed what he called the links bound. And the link bound has a very nice property that if we see here the matrix on the objective function of the formulation, the matrix is now linear in X. And actually, this is why he called it the links bound, linear in X. And this is a very nice property because it puts in the, uh, the formulation in a very elegant way and actually is very efficiently solved with you know, NLP solvers. Again, we can prove that the objective function is concave and smooth. Another interesting thing about the links bound is that is what we call self-complementary. So in this case, if we work with the inverse of the matrix, instead of working with the matrix, we have exactly the same bound. And this can actually be proven. And well, uh, it could be seen as a drawback of links is that it's very sensitive to the scaling factor. 
So if you don't choose this scaling factor to multiply your covariance matrix in a nice way, you can get a very bad bound. But on the other hand, we have proven in this more recent work that finding the optimal, optimal scale factor can be cast as a univariate convex minimization problem. So the objective function is actually a, a con con convex in the scalar parameter gamma, which, for, uh, which we use to multiply our covariance matrix. And finding the optimal gamma can be done very efficiently. And this makes a lot of difference on the we can actually, a uh, link actually gives very good bounds in practice if we use uh, the optimal gamma or a good gamma. Now, the justification of the links bound uh, comes from this very nice insight of Curtin Stryker, where he saw that this matrix L of X is actually this matrix here that we put in this format. And if we use the Schur complement determinant formula, then we can see that the determinant of this matrix here is actually the square of the determinants of the submatrix of C indexed by S. So, you know, Kurt was able to, to, to see this relation. And because of that, uh, gave this, you know, nice linear, uh, uh, matrix, right? The matrix linear in X in the formulation of the objective function of the relaxation length. And here we have our last bound that we are using most in our numerical experiments. Uh, we called it the factorization bound. This, the idea here was proposed by Mikolov in 2015. And we also consider this factorization bound in a more recent work where John and I have worked with his PhD student, Zhang Zhushan. And also we have a paper from Xi and Li where they consider this factorization bound in a, uh, some very nice results they have. So we call it factorization bound because to derive the formulation, the first thing we do is to factorize our covariance matrix here. As we write it as F, F transpose, this would be our factors. And we can easily see that uh, after factorizing the matrix C, so if you multiply the largest S hogging values of this matrix here, F transpose diagonal of X, F, we actually have uh, the determinant of the submatrix of C indexed by, by S whereas again is the support of X. Okay, so we have another formulation. This is the third formulation we present. This is another formulation for a, a relaxation of our graph. But again, here the, 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 we deal again with convexity. You're always dealing with convexity with all these kind of formulations. Because sometimes we have a formulation that seems very natural, but it's not a convex formulation, so we cannot solve it efficiently. And this is exactly what happens here. So the object function is not concave for this formulation. But the idea that was proposed by Mikolov, basically was used by him, was to, instead of solving this problem, solve the Lagrangian dual of this problem. So he proved it in his paper that the Lagrangian dual of this problem is equivalent to this one that we call defect. And as it is the Lagrangian dual, of course, this problem now is a convex problem. And as it is the dual of our relaxation, the solution gives us naturally an upper bound for C mask. But uh, there is also a drawback in this uh, uh, formulation. The formulation, the variables are matrices, right? We have semi-definite uh, constraints here. So it's too expensive to solve inside the branch and bound framework. But, you know, the, the, to deal with this, what we did was, I mean, it was proposed already by Nikolov, basically. We can construct the Lagrangian dual again of this problem. And when we construct the Lagrangian, and rule of this problem, we come back to the x variables. 
So we come back to the dimension that we had at the first formulation. Okay. Now this is the we can, we can prove that this is the Lagrangian do or equivalent to the Lagrangian do of the de defect problem. We call it de defect. And this has very nice properties that we have proved also in the paper with Zhongzhu and John. We proved that this, this problem is a convex problem. It's uh, you know, reasonably smooth. It can actually be solved very efficiently by NLP solvers. We proved that, that the factorization bound does not depend on the factorization. So you can actually work with any factorization you want. It leads to the same bounds. And we prove it that this doesn't change with the scalar case, scaling factor, but on the other hand, the complementary problem can help. So if you work with the inverse, you can get better bounds than working with the original. Now this gamma function here is not trivially obtained. It's actually this nice result from Nikolov where he proved it that that was the Lagrangian dual of um, problem uh, defect, and he defined this function gamma in a very particular way. What we prove it is that this, the value of, of this function gamma is actually the, the, the log of the determinant of the principal submatrix of C whenever X is a binary vector. So in fact, the defect as we presented is an exact relaxation for our problem. So these are basically the relaxations that we are working. Another thing that we did was to mix these relaxations in order to produce a, a convex combinations of the objective functions of the relaxations that led to what we call the mixing problem, the mixing bound. And finally, we have here some conclusions about all of this. We have presented then three convex relaxations for the problem that leads to three different bounds. We analyze which one of them are as sensitive to, to the scaling factor and to complementarity. Some of them are, some of them are, are not. But the biggest conclusion is that there is no winner here. So in fact, the best thing to do is to work with all these relaxations combined, like we propose, for example, on the, on the mixing methodology where we mix all these bounds and can we can actually improve the bounds obtained by each of them separately. So this is all I have to say and want more details about the convex relaxation and how we derive them. We have the, the, the book that I published with John last year and all the lessons that I, I mentioned also on the slides. So well, thank okay. you for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Marsha, for the talk. So uh, maybe we have time for one or two quick questions before we transition to Emily's talk, if there are any. So if you have a question, please uh, either raise your hand or type it in the chat and I can uh, I can read it off. I have a, a quick question. I noticed that some commercial solvers can now support, um, I guess, global non-convex uh, mixed integer cases. Like somehow in Gurobi, you can give it something non-convex uh, integer, and it will identify that. And it it well, I guess we yeah we have tried Baron to to solve this mm -hmm. problem, but uh, as I said, the fact that we have a non-factorable objective mm. makes this very difficult to solve by this global optimization. I see. As I see solvers, you know, so mm. it's it they're not good. Uh, the solution of this problem. And that's exactly why we, uh, the researchers makes it more interesting to mm -hmm. develop this convex in my NLP formulations. Okay, okay, great. Yeah, that answers it. Um, so any I'll, I'll have one questions? more yeah. quick question. Um, uh, well, actually, well, there might be a comment. Uh, yeah, actually, maybe Don, do you, do you want me to read it or would you like to uh, unmute? Um, do I need to unsecure? No, I think you're able to unmute it yourself. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. The bound is very clear. So I'm just wondering if you could elaborate on like the graph formulations on those type of questions. I think it's in one of your few slides. 
before the uh, convex covariance matrix. Uh, what what is the slide? Can you stop me when I get there? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. More? Yeah. Um, Here? Uh, I think before this. Uh, and before. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, um, I guess. Um, uh, I saw it. I saw it about like six slides down, I think. Uh, yeah. Here? Uh, somewhere here, maybe. Oh, but Don, maybe we could, um, if you if you remember it, we could. Uh, do you remember the general uh, context of the question? Um, uh, yeah, so, so I, I guess, um, I wonder uh, if there's, uh, there is any opportunity to apply, um, maybe graph learning to learning those best parameters, um, to solve the problem. Sorry, I couldn't hear because the alarm went off. Can you repeat the question? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I just wondering if there is um, any opportunity to using graph embedding to learn those parameters to find the bounds, since uh, we have a pretty much a constraint problem here. You mean to select the parameters to for the bound, like the parameters of the scalet problem and the mass? Is that the are those the parameters that you're talking about? Because if you're talking about these parameters that we use to improve the bound, like the mm -hmm. scaling parameter here, is that your question? We have you know, developed a lot of theory about how to obtain the best scaling parameter, for example, and the best mask to obtain the best possible bounds. And when we when it's concerned it to the scaling parameter, actually we can formulate a convex optimization problem for most of the relaxations where we optimize on the parameter. So we actually find the best possible parameter which minimizes the bounds by solving again a convex optimization problem, but in only in case we have a, a scalar DM, it's just one variable. So it's very best to compute the best possible parameters. I see, I see. Okay. So, so, okay, go ahead. So maybe in the interest of time, uh, Don, if uh, you could continue the discussion after the talks, because we will have a social session so that we can uh, move on to the second talk. But thanks okay, for I'll be happy to continue with you, Matt. Thank you for your question. Yeah. Thanks, Marsha. Thanks, Don. Thank you, Marsha.